Hello everyone, today we talk about the investiture controversy and more particularly of the pro Clement III, so Henry IV, um, anti Gregory VII ideology and narrative and even historiography, right? Given that we are exactly in the years of the synods of Vox of 1076 and the one of Bricks and of 1080, so properly in the uh, eye of the of the controversy storm, the excommunication of Henry IV, uh, the divorce the were fought at this point uh, between uh, Germany and Italy for reasons that uh, were deeply intertwined in fact with the same theological ideological disputes. Um, so a period that honestly we should deal with in much greater detail uh, in the future. Right, Christian history is um, is, is simply uh, mandatory for any possible understanding, not just of the Middle Ages, but of any history, including the one that you know didn't exist before Christianity. Given the the meaning of the same religion in that function, for not talking about the con the magnitudinal civilizational consequence on a world scale uh, up to this day, I know that history of religion is you know difficult to understand for people today, especially the history of Christianity. Most people have zero idea of what that even means, right? I, this is just what I was talking about a few minutes ago, um, privately about. Like, they, you, you discover that there are people also ra born and raised in Europe that, uh, or, you know, in the, the Western world broadly meant that actually do not know what, like, religion is. Like, they don't understand it. They never heard it like nobody really explained to them what it is i'm not kidding right i mean they know they religion exists it's not like you're born in china but you literally do not know the concept of religion because you have been brain uh, annihilated by communism that literally has made you for forget on purpose any form of cultural um any form of culture but any form of humanity in the first place uh, but the point is that the the investor struggle contains within it uh, a massive development within properly uh, the, within the same phenomenon in terms of just you know literary theological um, in fact also pamphletistic ideological but legal juridical properly um, and more like you know the entire um, development I mean the, the entire conception of the two universal powers was largely found that, um, at this point in political practice in ways that were fundamentally unresolved for the uh, for the millennium to come actually because um, with the reformation and the break of Christian unity this uh, this issue was um, and already at the time right with the break that existed with, with Constantinople etc uh, the uh, the matter would never be fully solved so we're still living within it Right, but at the same time, that w what I always say, that without this opposition between the two, this competition, right, this is the point, right, of it, between the two universal authorities that never disconfessed each other as such, right, they just looked at the fitness of the individuals who, who covered the respective office, but um, there was never a denial, right, of these authorities uh, per se also at the same time, but mostly about uh, their own prerogatives, right? And that's why also the Reformation was so, fra you know, fracturing, um, because there was fundamentally no connection to the um, historical tradition, most properly the Western Church, but way before the Gregorian reforms, right? Given how properly the Latin Germanic world had developed, uh, the uh, relation between the two universal powers. And just talking about that is is immense, so that's why I should make much more videos about this stuff, except you will not watch them. And frankly, I don't give a damn at this point, because, you know, it's your problem, not mine. Um, and naturally, I'm glad for those who actually watched this, because it's, um, again, Without this, you can't understand anything of any other content. Like if I talk about pagan religion, it doesn't make any sense. If I talk about medieval warfare, it doesn't make any sense, right? That's how important this is. Uh, and naturally, I couldn't make this um, 
that is without having made the others as well. Everything is interconnected and whoever thinks here that videos are separated from one another, you can't pick the ones you like better, it, it doesn't really work like that. You know, aside from individual personal preference, I also, I, I'm honest about this, like I, I you know, I like ecclesiastical history less in a sense, but the more I learn about that, and that's that's the point, right? You you must be properly educated, and, and the more you actually love it and understand the the importance of, it, right? And this is the the greatest challenge: accepting that if you don't like something, it's likely because you don't understand it, right? You don't know what you don't know what it is. You're just scared of your own ignorance and in denial because of that and so this is the history of everyday life for everyone and we have to make this effort which is absolutely rewarding um, in any case there is all a set of authors that we could look at when looking properly at the perspective of the Gregorian reform so here we are at the time of Hildebrand of Solana that as you know um, as Pope Gregory the seventh uh, issued emanated the the Dictatus Pape, right, in 1075, which basically he went as far as claiming, saying that the papal monarchy had an authority of on every uh, temporal power, right. So this um, naturally was just declared, in, a very, in fact it's a Dictatus, it's just like a list of relatively simple phrases, just linguistically speaking, but that are very let's say, um, very all-encompassing in their meaning, universally speaking. And so um, the investor struggle, as you know, revolved greatly around the, the not much the interpretation, but let's say the negotiation of, uh, in, in practical terms of, you know, between the two universal powers in terms of these prerogatives and their actual enactment, right? I made a lot of videos about this already in general. And in fact, there is an entire playlist dedicated to investor struggle. You can check that out if you are not particularly familiar with it. But again, it's mandatory, um, in my opinion, and not just my own, frankly. Uh, so, briefly, you know what happened in the Sinners of Worms in 1076. Uh, this was connected with the Pateria movement in Milan, where fundamentally there had been uh, some, uh, you know, political social hub evils connected with the, um, say, the, the pro-imperial, uh, the pro-imperial and pro-papal ecclesiastical factions, right? And um, the, this situation seemed to be resolved uh, regarding, you know, who was to be the, Arch the Archbishop of Milan. And when Henry IV interfered again, the Pope excommunicated him, right? And Gregory VII being the one that, of course, uh, pushed the most for, you know, in, in the broader wake of this uh, papal reform that had been started since Ottonian times and, and beyond, actually, the Carolingians, as we will see partly, um, was now uh, being pioneered by the same papacy from the within, uh, developing this dramatic ideological and spiritual and authoritative arsenal to get rid basically of any secular interference with especially the, in fact, what gives the names to the, the, the whole issue, that is the investitures, right? That is to say, who does decide that literally the, the clergy has, that specific clergyman has to be in office. And this went as up as, as the Pope himself, given that there were times which uh, we're just talking about it actually since the beginning of the Frankish Papal Imperial Cooperation in this sense with the um, with Lothar, right, and the uh, Constitutio Romana, where uh, basically the emperor had, uh, you know, mm, agreed with, with, the, with the pope that his envoys at the papal election could fundamentally express their own opinion regarding the, you know, the fitness of the same uh, pope, right, and and so they had been elected. So this was had always remained a very ambiguous situation. So I, I don't. I, don't, I will not repeat the entire story here, there of two, 200 years up to this point. But um, this was just the, the, a major and um, important turning point. There had already been essentially a, a reform going on, also, in fact, mediated between the papacy and, 
and the emperor and there had been already important struggles there was the, the council of, of sutra in the 50s where the pope was deposed but in general the the idea of church reforms had started mainly from the secular side of the story with mostly the imperial authority saying that especially the nobility of rome had a dramatic influence on the um on the papal elections and, and nobody had really fully controlled Rome not even Otto III had gone living there uh, because the city was uh, objectively was still the largest city in the west it was the uh, you know the very tumultuous right and especially the Roman nobility and but also the people were notoriously pretty difficult to control let's put it this way um, and the situation had never fully ended until the church herself began to you know through many forces also some radical ones as we will see to to strengthen itself and also to confer uh, herself actually that monarchic hierarchy that you know we would know it through uh, her through the, the entire middle ages up to, to this day right we're talking de facto of an absolute monarchy right um in spite of the the query etc um in any case uh at Worms, then Herring VIII had been excommunicated, there is all the episode of the humiliation at Canossa, but eventually, at the Council of Brixen, uh, 1080, the anti-pope Clement III had been uh, elected, factually, as Gregory VII had, was, um, was declared deposed, right? So, it, it, it started again, and this had deep repercussions in properly the entire political factionalism of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Because at this point it would be already essentially a division of what between what would be intended later, called later um, as Guelph and Ghibelline in many ways. So we're talking about wars, we're talking about, you know, sieges, battles, and pretty messed up things that um, engulfed the the whole empire and that we'll have to look at in detail um, at some other point but this aspect of, of violence flaring was essentially the most important one the central theme really of the anti-gregorian um the anti-gregorian propaganda as we will see the, the the light motive of this video is that of course within the church was some kind of aside from opinions differing on, on everything as always depending on the individual but there were still um, lots of points in common between the anti-Gregorian and uh, and the pro-Gregorian factions who largely belonged in fact to the reformistic current of those of those years I think naturally we were really to go in depth to the, the, the problem of the investiture contest per se is is very practical and, and political and military and social at the same time because the investiture of, of, of the clergy meant everything uh, for the balance of, of the various communities politically so um, it, 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 it it's, it's just obvious per se it entailed money great part of the problem here is that you know it was just a very powerful office to cover and, and there were cases of simony but also of a lack of ecclesiastic discipline so nobody really was particularly fit as we will see the uh, the Saint Gregorian um, faction met with uh, a great hostility in the same supporting communities because they didn't want to be fully reformed as the, the faction intended also from a theological point of view there were problems regarding the for example the, the validity of the sacraments that was uh, an old issue that you know by unfit priests I mean uh, that there was an old issue uh, as you know, since uh, you know the early Christianity and the uh, Gregorians had taken ambiguous stance, if not properly um, anti-patristic positions regarding to, to the matter, so everything was very complex and complicated. It was not like a categorical subdivision faction. In fact, nobody should really take. Um, these um, you know er everyone who has studied medieval history knows how flexible the entire thing really was right um, just a few uh, weeks ago I made that video about the uh, the the Sutra Council the second one um, in um, in the early 12th century 
meaningful location because of the aforementioned excommunication that was you know a, a rigid separation between accepted by both universal powers of of this you know investiture progress like you know just the pope has to care about the spiritual stuff and the emperor about the temporal one but it, it could never be implemented because simply the world of the time could not work by any stretch of the imagination with that actual separation because everything was deeply intertwined at every level so i advise you that video if you're interested in that specific topic uh, in any case again when we look at the propaganda the ideology that again was present in both sides this is not a time where people had what we could think like in in at least in the liberal sense of the term like a, an actual freedom of thought here there, there are no uh, heroes of modernity and secularism um, and all the uh, romantic if not diabolic mythology that has been invented from a from a couple of centuries to this time regarding history that has no historical factuality by any stretch of the imagination even in this case um, but uh, two sites that uh, normally and habitually would use certain specific propaganda arsenals to just smear their f adversaries and the interesting thing is that as sophisticated as it was naturally we get just the written stuff but there was an, an immense amount of oral um, propaganda that unfortunately is, is not documented that I mean people today still you know read these things and cannot understand the fact that this was a, an 11th century propaganda it's, it's not historical factuality um, and and the entire point of being a historian is reading these things m m being able to extrapolate the, the historical reality on the base of those specific instruments but I don't know this is the reason also fueled by anti-clericalism, especially anti-Catholicism, and etc. That you know, it's disgustingly, you know, uh, you know. I would call it mainstream, really. Even if I don't think mainstream does exist, but let's say um, the, a certain part of the Western world is so deeply ingrained with this. I think it's self-hatred fundamentally, uh, because of, of the incapacity of understanding, of course, anything historical, or ecclesiastical, or whatever, um, or theological, etc. But it's um, like these are the people who think, I don't know, that Boniface VIII was an evil pope that raped children, right? Because they cannot understand uh, what what it is like a, a medieval propaganda that nobody ever taught them. These people were never schooled in that, they've never been educated, their parents have never known anything about that. So they just cannot afford to understand. But unfortunately, they speak, right? I The only um, comments that I get... Uh, under my medieval Christianity videos are like uh, a few as always because they're not watched most but like let's say the, the few times it happened like 140 is a ah, great video finally somebody who talks about uh, Christian history in an actual historical uh, a ideological sense and the other says you know Ah, uh, you know, the Pope, while well, we pay taxes to the Pope still today, uh, these were corrupted evil, they banned the Bible, all, all the worst kind of, you know, uh, puritanic, uh, degenerate, um, you know, paranoia and, uh, you know, passive aggressiveness that, frankly, to this point in history is, you know, just an insult to the dignity of the, I think, the minimal human intelligence. Just, like, again, I think that if you don't know these things, you're... Uh, disgustingly undereducated, but I mean literally at a school level, at, at, a, at a parental upbringing level, right? And you know that I make history really without caring about uh, the the factionalism per se, just like today, you know, I'm, I'm making the anti-Gregorian uh, uh, propaganda video, for example, that is to say, let, let's see what these people said and what was their position, some th thought something, some somebody else um, of course there is a broader narrative in the importance of the investiture controversy and on the importance also of the papal monarchy there is no doubt but the point is that without uh, the, uh, each other th these things could have not happened so this is the meaning of history like if you're coming on medieval Christianity videos uh, just because you're you know uh, frustrated for some kind of you know cultural reason but it's not other people's uh, 
problem, right? That that's the point. It's actually your problem. You should solve it. Um, rather, um, I say this again, not not to distract you too much from the content, but because really I I made so many Christian history videos, and I realize by scale, therefore, uh, statistically, statistically, how few anyone really cares uh, that. Um, I feel the need to guide you through this content because otherwise, uh, you know, it would be useless. Like that's what I try to do on this channel. Not really presenting you the the, the, the tiny little story, crash course, uh, bullshit, and five minutes history, etc. I'm trying to present you, you know, from, from the within of our cultural perspective. Like, you know, what what's the deal, right, beyond it, right? And that most people don't, really see because they're ne ne not being trained to see it right just because they ignore their existence uh, in any case um, violence right it was a, a, a crucial issue because it touched theologically and, and beyond the problem of the imperium that is to say you know not only this Gregorian reforms were essentially diminishing imperial authority but as a consequence they were um, creating disorder, right? This was the point, uh, an absolute crystalline uh, secular power that in theory and traditionally would have also claimed part of its own sacredness, but this is another topic and a huge one, let's not uh, digress, um, uh, wouldn't, um, wouldn't allow fundamentally any disorder, which considering the 11th, you know, 11th century Europe, it's kind of a bit of a joke considering what Germany was, what Italy was, what any other country was at this point. Um, war was just the normal political dialectic because of the general uh, fragmentation of these communities. But that's why, again, the effort for maintaining greater order was so f deeply felt and important. Right? Um, as we will see, the, the, the same uh, synods of Worms and Bricks and were started also by some events that were with, you know, reflecting, uh, for example, social change, right? The rise of urban communities uh, in the Italic Kingdom, especially where the papacy had greater influence. Um, the Saxon revolt in Germany at this point, that especially the Council of Bricks and had been partially crushed by an imperial victory. Uh, on the rebels, and that that's what the point where Gregory um, also went essentially at Henry the, the Fourth again. Um, so this this is uh, the, uh, the the background, it, and it's ruthlessly violent uh, indeed from both sides. Um, so you cannot again even study ecclesiastical history without understanding the context of this. Right, there's not just again a uh, separated agnostic reality outside of real uh, uh, you know in fact of reality itself um, that where people discuss these things and th that's a very anti-religious anti-clerical point people usually make not religion is just fairy tale it doesn't actually have to do with anything it's just you know a, a, an extra problem that if there wasn't like you know all the world would be in peace like if you know anything about history at all you just know how uh, childish to say the list this statement can be and that's the point right we have been properly taught by socialistic deterministic materialistic relativistic um historiography not to think that this has a, a, an actual meaning within the realm of of reality proper um and uh, that's the, the insane problem that very often i, I must say also and the same uh, specialists uh, tend to to neglect, meaning, again, that you can't just study Christian history per se, right? You have always to have a context and a background. That's always what I say also. Many uh, religious, so-called religious people that actually do not understand anything about their own religion um, just teach these topics, uh, even if they did it in an unbiased way, like just per se, right? It's as if, you know, only... Christianity exists, it's just, just the church, just think about God, all the rest does not exist, you know, just remain catechistically indoctrinated and nothing else, how can't, that, that's, uh, that's a heresy, actually, that's agnostic heresy, 
and one of the cheapest way to lure the masses really into something that has nothing to do with the greatness of the universal tradition. Uh, but again, again, most most Christians are this today, right? And this is not about Christianity per se, which is, is, is something really beyond most people's understanding. As well as religion to core, I'm not even drawing a, relig um, uh, a barrier with other other religions because we're really talking about a broader universal again tradition that we have been taught to dismember in these bodies to pretend that uh, I don't know what just to remain limited in it in any case this is just too much digression now uh, in any case uh, Gregory the seventh was sent to in uh, for example Henry the fourth in, in, in a letter wrote non pastoris cura sed invasoris violentia apostolice sedis presidentem so something terrifying right you know that he, he ruled over the apostolic see not with the care of a pastor but with the violence of an intruder uh, and that it was the this ter terrible signifier schismatis that is to say the, the standard bearer of this of schism uh, this is the the kind of um you know, literal, also the verbal violence was uh, was used. Uh, uh, standard bearer of a schism who quote overturned ecclesiastical order, disturbed the government of the Christian Empire, and quote sowed discord among those who were in harmony. Right, qui ecclesiasticum subvertit ordinem, qui Christiani imperi perturbavit regimen. Qui inter concordes seminaviet discordia. Um, and the polemicists, they were, they were a group naturally of, of uh, ecclesiastics, were faithful to Henry the Fourth, right? For example, um, in the, the Italics, we will see the Italic uh, component was the most important. This is reflected also uh, at the Council of Brixen, right? When uh, Vibert of, of Ravenna was was uh you know the, the pr wrote on the fort that um had like uh i think 20 italian bishops eight german and like i think only one burgundian um so controlling at that moment the the northern italian cities was crucial and most of these names in fact come from there the polemicist bishop vito of ferrara for example, it's also very interesting to look at the names in in, in the Germanic forms because um, very often these ecclesiastics did have a Germanic connections, also from older times. Right, the Longobard Kingdom was in theory had a lot of uh, Germanic um, onomastics, but the uh, th these individuals were often also descendants of um, some you know, local no noblemen that were installed since Carolingian times or that had even connections properly with Germany, familiarly speaking, still at the time. And that uh, can be seen a bit ethnically also pro, um, more pro-imperial on the base of their more Germanic affiliation. This is a very interesting topic that uh, most people say no, it has nothing to do with that. What, but in part, there is some of that, but but not in fact because of the nationality, but because of the milieu and how they were influenced to reason like, right? And this has to do with the aforementioned topic of the uh, sacrality of the empire that north of the Alps was seen as in, in, in less modernized and secularized ways, but also traditionally in in a land like the Italic Kingdom. Um, Vito of Ferrara, for example, uh, wrote in the entourage of the same Archbishop Vibert of Ravenna. Right, uh, Ravenna, he, he was the Archbishop of Ravenna, but he, he had also, he was from Parma, actually. So, so this, again, still nord northern Italian milieu that shows also Ravenna was, as you know, the, the most competitive um, seat against Rome in Italy in many ways. Milan was rising and Ravenna declined, but still, right, there was the issue of the, properly of what would become the Papal States land and who was the head of the same 
of the the Italian metropolitan sea, right? So between the Rome Ravenna was this antagonism regarding the Roman prerogatives on this Romagnol areas that were also contended incidentally probably from a temporal point of view between the papacy and the empire would be up to the 13th century, up to the Habsburgs fundamentally would not be fully recognized as part of the papal state. But th we're talking about this kind of scale of interest. Henry IV's, um, uh, so anti-pope Clement III was um, in this sense the, the best pope, right, as, uh, as the Archbishop of Ravenna. Well, Vito of Ferrari was Emus Milieu declared uh, the following Illud quod precipum videtur et maximum in quo sibi solent omnes applaudere dicentes, quis unquam Christianorum tot bella movit, tot omines interenit. So, literally, the, let's say, preeminent and most important question which um, everybody is you know, unanimously asking themselves is, what Christian ever caused so many wars and killed so many men, right? And the reason it's obvious, right, it's not that people were not habitually killing each other <laughs> throughout the land uh, before the Gregorian reform. So, of course, uh, Gregory VII had triggered a, a very dramatic situation for which, as we will see, um, you know, the reason why he was also, the, the Clement the, the Third was, was created is that Gregory the Seventh had backed the Saxon rebellion in Germany against Henry the Fourth, the Franconian. So th that was seen as a, especially as a form of um, of betrayal, right? Uh, a pope had supported a rebel, so that was the point, right? That's it, that's the the actual mechanism uh, through which at, at Brixen the emperor decided, okay, Gregory is removed. And Brixen was important because it was uh, part of the German kingdom, but still south of the Alps. So it was this like a bit like Trent, right? You know, later on there would be this. Uh, also, think about the Council of Trent. So this kind of hybrid uh, German-Italian area that um, would represent, in a sense, both sides of the Alps. And, and we've seen how actually at Brixen there were the majority, uh, the, the the absolute majority of bishops was was from the the Longobard kingdom. And, um, but that was the point. This Gregory the Seventh is instigating rebellion uh, in in the Holy Roman Empire, so he's also, like, uh, this terror, aside from any legal procedure, could be also questioned, but let's say, properly despicable. He's causing wars, right? Also, Vito Ferrara didn't have doubts about Gregory VII's sincerity per se, right? Um, because he had known him, he had uh, leave, uh, Vito had lived in, in Rome during the early years of Gregory's pontificate, right? He uh, knew that the Pope was attentive, for example, to fast, was occupied in prayers, devoted to study, and he had even made his body the Temple of Christ. Right, and this this double view on, you know, on on the man and, and the, uh, covering such uh, such a uh, such a high office is also very important because it, it was depicting the Pope as very committed to his task, also in a in a spiritual sense, independently from the kind of you know n negative or positive direction this would take for uh, as a consequence in the empires we've seen and uh, Vito remembered for example when he was in Rome Gregory suffused with tears while celebrating mass daily and noting how for example he rejected the sophistication of the papal uh, cuisine for example and ate only wild herbs beans uh, pulses. Uh, so living de facto monastic life, because Ildebrand of Sovana was had had come from that very mo monastic uh, background of of Italic background of a Peninic background, etc. Uh, Tuscany, uh, 
and where were also these other you know followers and promoters of the reform very often radical ones but being really invested with that religious fervor so it, it's interesting that also uh, a pro Henry IV source like Vidal talks of the uh, you know again of the monastic lifestyle of Gregory VII within the same clamor and splendor of the papal court was criticized as being too you know too lavish very often um, also like Sigebert of Genbleu uh, was a, a Flemish bishop and we will talk about him because he also owned this kind of double view about Gregory Albite being in fact still against him uh, well Vito saw the need uh, to um, confound simoniacal heresy restraining religious adulterous priests with his word of the spirit uh, and and Gregory was about this they recognized that so it was not the reforming aims that after all had been shared by everyone in this context as we will see the same anti-pope Clement III was agreeing with some of Gregory's uh, aims and program but the point was the methods right uh, for example, the late boycott of guilty priests that pertain to the temporal sphere and thus to the emperor that, in fact, had constituted an, another step, right? Bringing disorder, not just to the church, but to the lay world, to, to the empire. How could, like, a priest, uh, at the end of the day, talk, even though he was the, the Roman bishop, uh, essentially telling the emperor what to do regarding the lay they mentioned. It was the, the, the main obvious kind of uh, note was criticized by the, uh, the pro-imperial faction, right? This, this rigid division between uh, the, the lay and ecclesiastical they mentioned that, of course, is kind of pretty manichaean in, in concept because in practice they were both interfering with one another uh, in many ways already from 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 ever and that that community would w couldn't work otherwise this was about stressing again propagandistically what was the the absolute ideal right in theory and Vita would say also this um, um, in ineo etiam schismaticus exitit Quod indignorum ministrorum et excommunicatorum sacramenta polluta docuit, non recipenda mandavit, nec sacramenta quidem dici debere peribuit, in quibus a sanctorum patrum regulis omnia licensit. Right, so he was criticizing the fact that Gregory essentially told um, the, the fact that sacraments of unworthy uh, priests and of excommunicates were uh, polluted, were were so infatiated, commanding that they were not to be received, and indeed forbidding them to be called sacraments, right? Which was again a settlement, uh, you know, think about the Donatist issue, Saint Augustine, etc., had been already set uh, by. The, the Holy Fathers traditionally, but had never kind of been fully settled um, in the world Christendom in practice, especially at this moment of great revival and it's an expansion of the church. And this was in fact one of the most controversial aspects of it all. Um, that the Saint Gregory dodged in a sense to, to address, but um, the um, to answer to the criticism, but it, it also was, in fact, part of the radical stances that were sent from, from the other side. That is to say, if we don't declare that the sacraments administered by these unworthy ministers are null, uh, how can we convince even people to pass from our side? Right. So it was a shrewd political move, but it was theologically risky as well, uh, because, again, the matter in many ways had never been fully defined even since much earlier times 
and and there were some disagreements. To, uh, I mean, generally speaking, the 11th century world or had already settled this. There was not like a broader controversy, but this mm, phase, uh, investor struggles, kind of reactivated it by by a certain degree, right? Because it was a quick way, properly, to get rid also of the unworthy ministers. And it, as we will see, this would very often take kind of a violent form. Like in cities, there were bands, there were, you know, there were street battles that would bring to the, the, the physical removal of these individuals and their retinues. And consider, again, that at this point, the entire refor reform of the church was also based on the fact that this, um, these individuals didn't even live like a common life. They had a pretty lay, uh, secular lifestyle. They had bodyguards. They, 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 had, they were married. I mean, that, up to that point, it had been normal in many areas, right? So they were powerful people. This was not about, again, uh, kind of puritanic uh, ideology per se. It was just about the, the mechanism, the, the dynamics of power that, that were dramatically interconnected with the ecclesiological issues. Uh, there is also a bit this infamous name, the Bishop Benzo of Alba. This is also northern Italy in, in Piedmont, for example. Uh, was considered like, you know, kind of a scurrilous pamphlet here. So I was kind of fulsome panegyrist. And, um, and it's definitely the most vituperative author of, uh, of Gregory VII at this time. But he also says interesting things regarding, for example, his position, right? He was devoted to the eradication of simony and clerical marriage as well, that were all as you know, uh, kind of points propugnated by the Gregorian reform. So again, there was not really much of a divide in, in line of principle on, how, on what the reform had to substantiate itself of, right? Uh, there was not a, an abyss. In spite of the pamphleting that existed here, the political divide and the accusations of these people being, say, uh, they are simoniac and they are... Uh, you know, uh, the deprivated and all these things. That's, again, the type of propaganda I was talking about before, right? It, it was normal to use this kind of attack, personal attack since ever, to smear the adversary. But this has nothing to do with the fact that both sides actually were, in many ways, close or emerging, even from similar backgrounds, if not the same. Um, for example, Benzo of Alba advises... Um, Henry the, the, the fourth to to reform the church himself as the the general feeling about the imperial role w would have had to be right if the church doesn't do it it's the, the emperor has to do it um, and in this specific uh, side of the story it should actually be only the emperor to do it right it's the emperor that should have that uh, discernment and, and that this command, let's say, to to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, in fact, especially this had, uh, Benzo advises Henry IV to be very, very discerning in creating bishops. Lest perhaps you draw disgrace upon yourself from the vice of a new incumbent. Let his life, morals, and conditions first be inquired into. A sort of virtue signaling in the sense of say be sh be aware that this bishop is not uh, of course like uh, unfit himself you should be the highest authority to decide that right um and so there are other scurrilous reference for example Henry must take uh, care not to mistake a cupid for an angel or to elevate a priapus to episcopal office right and this is the reference also to the um uh, to lu lu luxurious lifestyle, right? Sexual dissolute lifestyle that this, uh, you know, everybody accused each other of being, right? Saying, even saying Gregory the Salmon. Uh, and so, uh, again, it was pretty normal to, to accuse the other of such things. But aside from this, what is interesting in Benz is that from one side you see he accepts the emperor's right to appoint the bishops. On the other hand, he was preoccupied 
with the purity of the Epi episcopate in the same guise of the Gregorian reformers. So think even about kind of the middle ground that existed here between the two positions, even in the most kind of extreme kind of anti-Gregorian, anti-Gregories, because this, this is the point, right? Not anti-reformistic side. And that's where you realize how politically cut this factionalism really was, right? Um, then coming to Wiebert of Ravenna, it's definitely, a, you know, whose career especially is definitely a, a great example of uh, the pro-imperial side, of the, the eradication of abuses from the church, uh, etc. Um, he was elected, as we've seen, as anti-pope in the Synod of Brixen. He became the symbol of the imperial church opposition to Gregory VII. For, th for this reason, he attracted all the has of papal propaganda, uh, given that the pro Gregorian polemicists um, uh, name it as heresiarch, apostate, the new Simon Magus, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, this is a quote from the Re Revelation 13, 1 to 4. Uh, Wibertus Demens, right? So Mad Wibert, that rhymes beautiful with Clement. Clement, the, as Clement the Third, he had called himself as an anti-pope. So Wibert's, Wibertus Demens instead of Clement so is to say out of his mind, literally, as in Latin. That's that's what it means. Um, and um, and of course recognized just with his own name, not a, not a, not a papal one, that he had usurped according to them. Uh, as well, and um, quote, um, si uh, aliquis nefandus episcopus predicaret et preciperet fornicationem vel simoniam sicut quibertus demens. Right, so properly, he would become the wicked bishop who preaches and orders fornication, uh, that uh, as the model of what the Gregorian bishops of course, must not be, right? But Webert was, as well, a reformer, right? He was a, a zealous opponent of simony and clerical marriage, and that, as we've seen also in other videos about, I think last year I made one of, on, on marriage, especially uh, in, the, in the 11th, 12th century, in some areas of Europe, it was perfectly normal. Right, nobody had ever. We're talking about heirs like northern France, England. Like it was normal just to, you know, f for priests to, to be married, and nobody. And, and these were all fervent Catholics. They they saw nothing wrong with that, and they didn't understand what the Gregorian form ultimately wanted about this. Um, he said, of course, the, also, the properly the Holy Roman Imperial reality was. Uh, just more invested in these issues for the obvious reasons of that all this kind of reformistic wave had taken since uh, especially the Ottonian times given that uh, the Ottonians uh, made an enormous ideological work right the entire reform again was ideologically uh, restructured by them and extended and implemented because they they lacked a a, a truly central power and so they they would exalt their own, for example, their own Romanity, um, rather than their own Saxonity, let's say, um, or uh, etc. Uh, whereas the um, the Roman Church was the one closer, properly, uh, just uh, to 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 the fitness of uh, just more advanced culturally, right? Because of the Roman legacy, the highest literacy, properly, the uh, the greater just connection without. Uh, with other Christian countries, given the, the papal connections with the entire continent, so it was much less provincial and more public and imperial minded, and that's why the same papal monarchy emerged as such uh, from an investiture controversy and um, and from the reform in, in, in practice. Um, so it's fair to say that Vibert of Ravenna actually shared an important set of preoccupations of, of the same Gregorian party, especially the one for the uh, restoration 
literally restaurationem officiorum sancte dei ecclesiae that is to say the restoration of the offices of the holy church of god uh, which he implemented as archbishop of ravenna himself right uh Liebert promoted there the vita communis the common life of regular canons that was a mirage in most lands right uh, the idea that properly they had to be the, the bishop had to leave um together with his own uh clergy his bishop right and having this common life based on the canons etc that you know uh, at this point basically uh, no one followed right and that uh was in fact the ideal of a set of the gregorian reforms um for example pick uh, a champion of the same like peter damien one of the most imp spiritual most important figure spiritual figures in the entire western middle ages uh well in one of his letters peter damien uh was also Gregory the Seventh's confident and legate in Lombardy, uh, uh, you know, propagated uh, the necessity of canon li uh, of common life according to regular canons. The same Bishop Anselm the Second of Lucca was an important canonist and also um, close to the very close to the the highest reforming uh, and also properly international uh, milieu. Again, this all part of the Italic Kingdom as well, and this um, um, this kind of more uh, central Italian dimension for which many of the reformers had had come from. So while Wibert was somewhat successful in encouraging some members of the Ravenate clergy to volunteer for the common life, the by, let's say forcing hands. Um, ended in actually violent resistance and failure right they wanted basically to convert the, the life of people habituated to to maintain a you know to to live privately with, with retinues etc just to, to live in in relative poverty uh in in the church etc this was a a big deal right um and consider these were some of the areas where kind of was easier to cover those offices practically right but the certain areas north of the alps were like you know somebody had uh an ecclesiastical office and just lived completely elsewhere doing something completely different right so the gregorian reforms were seeking to restore effectively what the canons had established and you know they, it was just the beginning of a very courageous step that would eventually succeed just to, to this point um, in fact, the same Gregory the Seventh would not manage to to impose the common life on the whole Roman clergy, right? Uh, only in the same in the same latter, and it's uh, not before in fact the, the pontificate of Calixtus the Second in eleven twenty one. So we're at the end of the essentially the what we formally know as the investiture controversy. Just a year after, there would have been the concordate of Worms. But let's say uh, that the, the regular canons permanently were ca permanently established also in the Roman Church, right? So uh, a huge effort that lasted for a long time. Considered that also what Gregory VII did in his lifetime was considered um, just temporary. Like nobody thought that after his death this thing would have necessarily continued. So as you know. We call them Gregorian reforms. They were much more important popes in the second half of uh, of, of the um, of, of the eleventh and the first half of of the twelfth century that implemented this further in the actual reforms. That practically speaking were uh, also much greater work and reflected the expansion of papal power. Also, the, essentially, the victory against the emperor uh, in Italy, as you know, the conquered that of Worms would effectively sanctioned that officially well, the investiture uh, uh, carried out by the emperor and the, the, the pope respectively in Germany and Italy so an important uh, strike to the also to the 
imperial universal prerogatives. Now, when the same Anselm of Lucca attempted to enforce common life in his cathedral chapter, for example, he was even driven out of his diocese, right? Um, so we're talking about, again, intense interests of people that, that didn't want or had reasons, political connections, etc., for which they wouldn't live like that, they wouldn't maintain that discipline. And think about this in terms of actual moral effort. Like, you had to renounce, real, this was a real spiritual reform, because you had to start living in a different way, in a very different way, and renounce a great part of your prerogatives. Yeah, doesn't matter how powerful the church came to be later, but still, right, in many ways, this was setting some standards that would be maintained later on, right, in in the practice of the same ecclesiastical administration and beyond. Anselm of Lucca was also the author of the most important Gregorian refutation of Vibert of Ravenna's claim to be lawful pope. That is the Liber contra Vibertum et Sequaces Eius. So, the book against Vibert and his followers. Here, uh, v uh, Clement III is qualified as the leader of the party of Simoniacs, which, as we have seen, not just Vibert was not, but that simply did, did not exist, right? No, it was not like a party of, of the Simoniacs, right? There was. In practice, yes, a lot of simony going on everywhere, uh, as we've seen in the same Gregorian environment, but, you know, there couldn't be a part of simony acts because it was an untenable position. It's just, like, a ridiculous, right? And that's where, again, the propaganda struck, because accusations of, of simony, of sodomy, of all these things were pretty standard, right? Uh, again, people think that, you know, just... Ah, this guy was called a sodomite, so he was, you know, a sexually depraved. So, being a sodomite didn't even actually mean that, right? What what it came to to mean vernacular, let's say, popularly today. But it was just the standard pack insult to define uh, a morally corrupt, uh, you know, to you know, to actually insult somebody by calling him morally corrupt in in that regard. It was again for what these two sides were doing all the time against each other. They would keep doing forever, as long as, you know, some, something regarding the church and also the, the empire was concerned. Vibert, however, was touched by this uh, because, you know, it was an entire work written against him and in these environments also, there was a, a, a big deal of written culture, lig uh, literacy, etc., so he published um, uh, the decrees of his Synod of 1091, in which an encyclical says, following the documents of the Holy Fathers, the, the Synod attacks the, the simoniacs who, who make the, the Church of God a den of thieves. Right? This is from Matthew 21, 13. And strove to lop off with the sword of St. Peter the hand of that heresy which had to come to life again after being cut off so many times by ho the Holy Fathers. Right? So, uh, the, uh, the Vibertine Synod thus believed, just like the Gregorians, that Simone was a heresy. And him, again, who would have not thought of that at the time? And not only, the Synod admonished also the clergy to preserve the purity of chastity, without which, as the Apostle bared witness, they cannot please God. Right, so it was basically a reformer on the full line, right? Except, if we look at the program of 1091, we see two aspects, right? And this gets to the imperial side of, of, of the story, right? why he had been elected as anti-Pope in anti-Gregorian function. At this time, actually, um, the, the Pope was Urban II, uh, was a rival of the same Clement, uh, because, you know, things happen, by the way, in between, and we're skipping them clamorously, but again, we have to, to finish at some point, in, uh, again, just looking from a 
an ecclesiastical perspective for now. So Bibert refused to include the lay ambassador of bishops in his definition of simon, right? So this was the entire point of the Gregorian Reformation. Like the emperor could not, for any reason, invest bishops, right? Uh, there could be just a kind of kind of a consent, etc. But the, at least this would be negotiated later by the investor. But in absolute terms, bishops were were to be invested by by the church and thus the the, the pope as a monarch of 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 the same, um, and nothing else because this was the church it had nothing to do with any empire, right? So. The, the accusation of simony was naturally that this lay ambassador in did entail some, as actually the same ecclesiastical one, some interest of sort, and so it was easy to make the equation with simony. Well, Vibert refused this because it was, as we'll see, like an imperial habit to just invest the bishops, and it was kind of obvious, right? Especially considering that before the papal monarchy, it was not really just like a... Um, there was a lot of communication with Rome, etc., but for the most practical administrative reasons uh, and just local influences, etc., the, the emperor say, I don't know, wanted that guy on, uh, on uh, in, in the bishopric of Mainz, he would kind of have some talk with Rome about that, but say, he would just invest the bishop as well. Right, it was just an internal thing uh, to to yeah, of Germany and, or and or other other milieus. And again, how fragmented it was it was unbelievable. But let's say uh, that's how the entire world worked, right? So at this point, the Pope began to say that has at least no kind of place, right, in absolute terms, to exist. And more practically, well, that shouldn't be seen as uh, the actual confirmation of that 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 uh, bishop's office. Secondly, speaking of clerical chastity, Wibert Synod of 1091 has communicated those who um, quote reject the masses of sinful priests, right? Um, which uh, went against what went against what. Gregory the Seventh had commanded, right? Um, the reason being the aforementioned sacramentary validity, and that is to say, the priests who were deemed to be, in fact, sinful, and who is not a sinner, by the way, but in any case, um, who had sinned to the point being, for example, invested by the emperor, you see what's the point, um, uh, wouldn't uh, had to be properly rejected because uh, falsely as their sacraments would have been invalid, and so the same community would have de facto remained excommunicated because the validity of the sacraments locally would have not had would have been no. And that went, in fact, also as we were saying before, against the general praxis. Right of the 11th century at that point, it had never been much of an issue after all. Um, the patristics had fundamentally solved the problem, saying that you know that the matter of uh, sacrament is how you receive it in, in your in your heart in your soul, and so um, it has nothing to do with with the with the guy that personally administers that sacrament, because in that moment he's just a priest, and he is, it, it's valid as far as you're concerned as he has been consecrated. But naturally, there were some ambiguities regarding this concept as well, and at least these were exploited, again, ideologically by the Gregorian reforms. And so, Vibert, in this sense, was still, with these two differences, basically saying, well, you know, the emperor not only can uh, invest some bishops, but also uh, these bishops sacraments uh, administration is is uh, is not sinful right it, it's it's valid and it can't be carried on and uh, the faithful are uh, are not excommunicated right 
in, in the process. Um, so these may seem very important issues, but they would be part, as you have understood by now, a broader dialectic that looked at real strength ratios, right? If we pick Bibert of Ravenna, Bit of Ferrara, and Sigebert of uh, Jean Blue, the, the, the latter, by the way, following Ribert as Pope, given that he was Clement the Third, in, the, in their eyes, they recognized him as such, not as anti-Pope, while Gregory was considered deposed. Um, well, the, the main problem for them all was the aforementioned uh, violent consequences of the Gregorian reform, right? Uh, for example, St. Vibert writes Quanta enim humani sanguinis et fusiones in italico et teutonico regno occasione predicationis eorum fact sint. So how much bloodshed was perpetrated in the Italian German kingdoms in 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 the occasion in the con within the context of the of the preaching, right, this Gregorian preaching which definitely had, as we were saying before, also probably a kind of political and military character, right? There had been violence, uh, assaults on simoniac and married clergy that had triggered the fact of civil war within the empire, its cities, right, it, 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 its countries. And, and so this was seen as the proof, ipso facto, of the Gregorian unfitness, right? The idea that this, this ideology was destroying, practically, the imperial order, right? And um, that was quite different, by the way, from what had already been experimented in the first decade of, of say, the, the papal reform movement between 1046 and 1056, when things had not degenerated to that level of violence. Um, and Sigebert of Jean Blue, uh, on behalf of the Church of Liege in 1103, said, um, Quis poterit discernere causam regni a causa sacerdozi? Right. This this the deep question, right? Uh, Nisi pax dei. So properly, uh, copulet regnum et sacerdozium uno angulari lapide concordia vacillabit structura ecclesia super fidei fundamentum. That is to say. How can you separate properly the cause of the empire from the co the cause of, of the church? Like, um, if you like, unless the peace of God joins kingship and priest, in, you know, in the, the emperor and the church, in the one cornerstone of harmony, the building of the church will totter on the foundation of faith. Right. So, you couldn't put one against the other. And this violence had produced itself exactly because of the lack of uh, the sanction of imperial power to enforce the reforming program. So the Gregorians essentially not being able to, to hold the imperium that that decision entailed, so stripping it from, from the rightful uh, holder had been obliged to resort to essentially nonsensical violence, where the entire point of the imperium is providing this authoritative, rational, kind of orderly, disciplined uh, uh, peace. First of all, right in, in the empire, this has been broken because the pope had decided to essentially here it doesn't say openly, but to in practice, usurping the authority, and, and thus the imperium itself of the divinely ordained emperor. Now, it would be interesting to to think what the Gregorians actually thought about this, because the of course they would have never said the thing explicitly otherwise. But if the imperium is not right, uh, you know, the, if the empire doesn't actually manage to control um, to the the situation. Uh, somebody else also has the Imperium, 
let's leave aside that it was also Constantinople at this point, but let's say, of course, there are the forces of evil, and the Gregorians could never say they were. Uh, whereas, the, of course, the the Enrichians, like it's called in this way, thought that. Um, but this meant that the, the Pope did actually have some temporal power that could use against the Emperor in practice, according to the very traditional idea. This naturally could not be accepted in the institutional rules, it wouldn't mix up the things. But it, the Dictatus Papa objectively uh, equated to it, because literally there was nothing that the Emperor could do if the Pope did not agree. So literally in the Dictatus Papa it was written that whichever action, if the Pope said no, could not be done. So that de facto equates to, uh, to of course, having a spiritual authority, but it manages to, to bend the Imperium to its will. And, and this, this gets very interestingly, you know, some theological, metaphysical levels, because at that point you have to define more properly what can be uh, seen properly as, uh, as factual, as, as temporal power. Right, the leap of saying, okay, we own the Imperium would not be done, even though, I mean, later on in history it would, it, it would be done. Boniface VIII said that, right, said, I am the Empire, right, and that uh, the, the King of France was saying the same, and the Emperor too, of course, but nobody, you know, it was not the most important thing. But at this point, of course, everybody was quite careful also at say not being too too explicit also in some of the other concepts because at that point it could have backfired like saying what you're saying is beyond right just Boniface VIII could do it after what the the papacy had managed to become after this but at this point uh, the church didn't even have like uh, you know dramatic it was not a state we see it was not really a monarchy per se it, it, it didn't have the massive statal bureaucratic administrative fiscal capacity would have later. So this was really about the spiritual fitness and what could be claimed in a, in a very high sense that, as we've seen, as a strictly moral load was present within the reformers as, as hell, and that's why the Gregorian reform also succeeded. Um, also, the... Um, Sigebert goes on and says, Recolliga quomodo a Beato Silvestro usque ad Ildebrandum sedem Romanam pape obtinuerint, et quot et quante inaudita ex ambitione illius sedis perpetrata sint, et quomodo per reges et imperatores definita sint, et pseudo pape dampnati et abdicati sint, et ibi plus valuit virtus imperialis, quam excommunicatio in de brandi, odardi pascasi. Which, trying to translate here, um, so consider how the popes uh, had been obtaining the Roman see from his time of Sylvester I to that of Ildebrand of Soana. So Gregory the Seventh. How many? Uh, and that was not here. Of course, it's not m said Gregory, but Hildebrand, like like they they said before to Guibertus Demens and not Clemens, who of course was not considered Pope. But imperial side, how many unheard of crimes were committed out of ambition for that see, and how they were checked by kings and emperors. And f and false popes condemned and deposed. Imperial might was worth more there than the excommunications of Hildebrand, that is Gregory VII, Aldo, that is uh, Urban II, and Pascal, Pascal II, uh, that were the popes, that were some the most, as you know, also powerful, and especially Pascal II, but also Urban II, it's the same one of, of the First Crusade, but Pascal II especially owns a very important role in the Gregorian reform. It's not the most important one, uh, debatably, in in um, in absolute terms of effort, like and built uh, building up of the entire monarchy, but uh, it was a gradual process, right? And always struggling with with the emperor as well. There were wars again being fought at this time. Um, 
So, Sigebert models of correct conduct were the one of, of Gregorius Magnus, Gregory I, who uh, respected the authority of Emperor Maurice at the time, the talking about the end of the 6th, the beginning of the 7th century, so there are these interesting historical references. Um, and Leo IX, uh, which was m more recent, uh, who in fact had co been cooperating, according to this reading, uh, reading the reform of the church with his kinsmen, it was the Emperor Henry III. So these were the Henrys that were ruling at the time, Henry III, Henry IV, Henry V, that as you know, we're also the one practically involved in, in all this investiture controversy. Um, and so it was very important to stress the parallelisms, as we'll see now, between figures like Charlemagne and uh, the Ottonians, too, that had de facto started the reform and ruled in Rome, etc. So the moment of great glory of the empire, right, where the empire had been the strongest in, in relative terms to also... The, talking about the control on, on Rome, or on Italy, and so on. Um, and Vibert of Ravenna essentially imitated the aforementioned models in this uh, uh, propaganda, right? He uh, had risen to prominence by faithful service to the imperial court, gaining the favor especially of Empress Agnes that was the widow Henry the third and mother of Henry the fourth um, uh, to, to whom Vibert had def devoted himself as Pope to cooperate and this cooperation was quite concrete not just anecdotal uh, consider we will make videos about properly the moral loading as we were saying before properly the, uh, the the imperial power and of generally speaking of the medieval knight uh, through his Christian fate. I mean Vibert was uh, as Clement the third Pope um, a, an, uh, a universal necessity for the world. He couldn't just say well okay I'm an emperor I'm excommunicated and okay I will simply go on with that. Right. In, in part, this could be done in much more secular times, um, in modern times, like later on, uh, where still anti-popes were created, but they were not necessarily always created. And, th of course, this depended on the reaction uh, of, of the emperor, in part. But Henry IV needed, for his Italian campaigns, for example, the spiritual support and, and guidance of a pope. Right. And at the time, this was deeply felt, properly as a matter of, you know, God will... This was the, the same years of the, uh, essentially, the construction of the theology of crusade. And, and so, uh, the, the, the moral load was, was necessarily deriving from the same clergy that was deemed to be necessary for the fort. It couldn't be a fractured ecumenic order in this sense between the, the papacy and the empire to wage rightful campaign, military expeditions, for example. Um, Vibert was meant also to defend uh, the emperor against rebels, uh, criminals, right? Um, so uh, this was a, a, a joint papal imperial uh, effort also to preserve the same religious foundations protecting them, their privileges, right? Because in all this, as we've seen, there was half of, of, of the clergy was under attack, right? And also attacking the others, but let's say were quite concretely, you know, at risk of losing their own property, their own foundations. We're talking about very rich, we're talking about the, the, the capitular sees, uh, chapters, the, 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 the monasteries, the cities in which the, the same bishops de facto ruled and that's why the Italian uh, kingdom was so important because uh, there since Ottonian times the bishops were the counts they ruled from the cities right unlike Germany so if they if the emperor wanted to be emperor in the first place reaching Rome to be crowned and maintaining that he, he had necessarily to control the Italian kingdom and, and it is within the, those city gates that the clash was being consumed most. 
So this was dramatically difficult uh, to handle because uh, the bishop is one guy. Yes, it can be a powerful one with retinues controlling a section of the city, but it's just one guy and cities are growing. And the, the papal forces are normally supporting these uh, emerging, um, say, classes that are... Uh, we, we, say we've seen it with the Pataria that was also kind of a extremistic uh, kind of populistic even in a sense uh, leftistic movement we could say still within the church still recognized Rome but it was also about the the powers the, the abuses of the bishops of their of their forces etc of course the communes here were taking shape would take shape exactly from this and those were always led by the local nobility knights uh, so it was never like a, a class struggle but let's say the city as the place where lots of uh, significantly armed people that especially in the italic kingdom had this strong municipal military tradition and pride and sense of belonging and in esprit de corps as you know freemen by the way because it, in, in the italic kingdom the subjects are traditionally free unlike germany where they are traditionally somebody else's people well it was ideologically very uh unsettling for for an imperial rule on in the kingdom this is you know why one century later you have the wars between frederick barbarossa and the lombard league right we're talking about the same ferments that the papacy uses to make leverage uh, against in the imperial favorites on the uh, episcopal seats within the cities right uh, naturally the pope in part will lose control on them because never had really a control of the cities the communes in fact would form and the papacy would never quite manage or think that realistically to, to take over uh, northern italy well yeah i mean by the early 14th century we made a video about this um the uh, the papacy and the visconti crusade that that was a big thing but it was just the peak of papal temporal power uh, in, in that context and so it's a very different scenario from this one here was about having kind of um supporting those forces who had other reasons to essentially uh, expel imperial interference in the local in the local affairs which was essentially later on what the lombard league asked for right autonomy right always recognizing the emperor and, and paying the due but not really what the emperors wanted to, to to seize more and again it was always the nobility that de facto carried out this the as we've explained countless times, that the communal movement was formed by the consular, that is the military class, the knights, right? And so this was a very, but very delicate uh, situation. Uh, so the ideals of harmonious cooperation um, were, you know, speaking of this, you know, quite abstract reality were the uh, the emperor just had to support the, the papacy and vice versa etc were far from the truth but it, it still the ideology was was fueling important uh, political forces that wanted to oppose instead these uh, urban movements they wanted to keep the, the feudal hierarchy in place because they had to benefit from it the, the more kind of would become the Ghibelline part in a sense, even though it was very different later on from, from this thing now. But still, of course, the point of the pro enrichments let's say, was to uh, point at the election of the Pope by imperial hands, right? Uh, the Pope is consecrated at the command of Caesar, wrote Benz of Alp, uh, who also said that literally in domo etenim domini estis plantati manibus regis that is to the bishops remember that you're planted in, in the house of god by imperial hands uh, which again is you know it's kind of interesting view regarding the imperial but this is a fully caesar papistic idea 
right? It's like what happened in Constantinople that also put to death popes, uh, uh, patriarchs, right? Not really the best example. And that probably sclerotized also from the within because the, there was not a spiritual force that was able to counterbalance uh, imperial authority in a sense, in, in a functional, in a challenging, in an antagonistic way. You can argue that eventually the the empire collapsed in its universe in the West in its universal ambitions. Well, but then what kind of empire it is if it if it does, right? And in any case the empire actually remained and the cooperation between Pavas and Empire too as well, in spite of the iteration. It was always something more, you know, practical, less um, you know, abstract than it seems. It was the actual power in the, in those lands. And uh, you would be surprised by how much Western civilization benefited from from this. Then Benzo said also that the emperor's duty was to choose the bishops whose teachings would recall the languid world to salvation and read the Church of Pestilential Disease. Um, and, and consider that there was a status quo before Gregorian times, for which it was really a tradition to point at, right? As as the the the, the habit, the custom made law in part or rule at least according to them. Um, for example, there's this passage from Herman of Tournay from the Liber de Restauratione Monasteri Sancti Martini Tornacensis which goes like this. We read in the life of St. Gregory the I, so Gregory the Great, that when he had been elected, that, like, that was liked so much by the Prime Regents because he, would, he passed from an example of obedience to Emperor Morris, in fact, had been elected to government of apostolic see and was reluctant, the Romans sought the consent of Emperor Morris and raised the elect through his means to the papal see. Right, which was a bit also interesting because it mixes um, with the imperial right of coronation in Rome when it was the Roman people that actually had to acclaim the emperor to become such when it was crowned as such by papal hands. So see how subtle this text is. And although the same thing it goes on, is also read in many other places that holy men were raised in the episcopate by kings, suddenly in the time of of the elder Henry IV, the Roman Pope Gregory VII forbade anyone to be elected or appointed by him. What a terrible thing, right? And the point being actually that the situation had been the other way around for quite a long time, right? It was just the Ottonians that had fundamentally enforced their own rule by a certain degree on this kind of uh, mechanisms uh, that they had never actually managed to fully control them. But they had, uh, also with the aforementioned practice of bishops, counts, etc., always um, kind of retained this, from their side, this prerogative, right, namely formally, of electing bishops, or, and that works, however, by just by uh, church rules, well, elected, really, by the by the church right so it was rather the emperor that had stepped in at a certain point and began to elect to elect popes and and bishops archbishops and that was not the actual practice of course there was always a comparticipation of the two authorities right it was difficult in fact to just enforce a you know, uh, uh, a clergyman in, in an office that, you know, was a lot of, in fact, uh, interest for locally for, for not having. And that's what had also triggered movements like the Pataria, the Pataria, um, and why there were some factions. Also, the, the, the last Italic kings that had arisen against the, the last Ottonians uh, were fundamentally opposed to this policy. They were a powerful party faction and they still embodied some kind of, you know, actually of secular rule against, you know, the, the one of the, the Germanic uh, 
uh, kings, given that the, that was the competition, right? Who would become emperor? Those who could control Rome uh, and be crowned in many ways. That was the only point. But in theory, the empire had to be universal. So there was always this kind of race and ambiguity. And now civil authority under, as it would be mostly in this period of transition under the communes, would fundamentally um, have something to say as well. So that the Italic Kingdom factually was never really controlled by by the Germanic emperors as, if anything, because they after they were crowned in Rome, they would always have to come back to Germany. And they, they always you know, had some supporters in Italy that would rule on their behalf, but factually they were autonomous. And in many cases they wanted to remain as such, like those uh, Italians were called uh, Frederick Barbarossa because the Milanese were expanding uh, over them and they thought the imperial authority would, would, would save them and instead imperial authority began to squeeze them worse than the Milanese and guess what they did? They sided with the Milanese, right? So, again, this um, view that the emperor had always, after all, elected the popes, well, my eyes, because actually the, the, the church is pretty clear about this and it, they were right regarding the church per se, right? The church has nothing to do with the empire properly, right? In metaphysically speaking, it just belongs to another dimension. It's not even part of the empire, um, but it just has to comfort it in a way. And so also the, the empire would say, well, if we are given, however, power by God, our power should be recognized and shouldn't be just uh, the Bishop of Rome deciding whether whatever we do is, 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 is right or wrong, because if we, God has given us power, it is to rule. The point could be, well, you could also be a tyrant, you could also be the next Antichrist that has to come to rule the earth, and will come to rule the earth before the second come of Christ. Um, so, you see, nothing on an ideological level could be really kind of flattened to the point, okay, well, you know, everything is settled, ha, huh, you know, sorry, I thought it was this way, no, it was that way, so I agree and starting, you know, living a perfect, uh, you know, cooperation without any form of attrition between papacy and empire in a world where just, you know, it was not even uh, a centralized state or anything, like, it, it would always be like this, but, again, all this thinking, you see here what these authors do, they dig in history, they look at perspectives, they, 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 they express concepts. It was very subtle, and it sparked a dramatic civilizational uh, capacity. The same Roman law would, would be revited by the pro-imperial party, right? Because they wanted to adopt, again, the Byzantine model with, of uh, Caesar papistic power uh, through the Justinian code. And, you know, that was all a, a, a massive juridical, cultural fire philosophical, philological, literary, linguistic uh, work that is as, as the root of the same humanism, if you want. And, and all happened within this dichotomy within the empire. And this helped Germany in a sense as well. I mean, developing, well, it was, okay, let, let's not digress on Germany because it otherwise becomes way too complicated. But let's say that uh, the same events of Germany reflected this division. Right. In Germany, as we've seen many times in our medieval German playlist, there was always a kind of resistance to centralization as anywhere, but in Germany more because this, the, the political institutional structures just were not historically particularly developed. It was a relentless effort that built up also this specific, I don't know, the German federal culture in this regard, but also the need of, of a hand, like the, the uh, it's not a coincidence that the imperial force and ideology lived more in a country like Germany than, say, France, where actually the Carolingians roughly had ruled from as a s real center of power. So, okay, th this is meta, you know, it's b way beyond this video. <laughs> but these are all perspectives that you have always to consider, and that's why I make so many videos, uh, because they all compenetrate each other and must be known and, and thought. Um, Sigebert of Genbleu also underlined the example of the quote, holy and re reverend bishop who rendered to Caesar what was Caesar's and to God what was God's, Matthew 22, 21, right? And 
quoting the Gospels about this was quite dangerous, considering what the, the Gospels, in this sense, uh, d definitely not not directly say about this in in these term in the terms at least the, the pro imperial faction would have liked to, to see in this in this quote. Um, Sigebert in particular believed that such holy and reverend bishops, as he, as he calls them, uh, sancti et reverentes uh, episcop, um, had fl flourished in the Ottonian age. Again, the Ottonian age that has started it all, the reform, the fact that the, uh, had rehinged Germany with Italy and uh, created this, uh, the, the, the Holy Roman Empire, and this axis on the base of which fundamentally was the Roman Pope and the German Emperor that, that, that ruled and made the thing happen, was seen as properly the, the Golden Age. Right, and it is true because never, in relative terms, in relative terms, the the Germanic Empire had so much power like during the Ottonian Age, right? Um, not even at the peak of the Swabian era during Frederick Barbarossa, there was so much like compared to the other powers that existed. This is what I mean. Uh, the Ottonians had ruled over Italy, had ruled over Rome, had even pushed south further. Right, and if it hadn't been for lots of things, they may have consolidated a, a much different power, maybe even established properly, a, or at least laid the, the foundations for a much more public centralized state. Maybe the, the surely Gregorian reforms would have not happened at some level. Um, some dynamics would have probably presented themselves not in the, quite the same way. Just maybe the outcome of a battle like the one of uh, thrown in uh, 900. 82, where the, the, the German ability was loaded by the Saracens, like, w would have probably changed a lot of things that we would live in a completely different world, like all changed, etc. But so they, they were right in a way to see in, in that age like something very, you know, coherent with mm, the current times. After all, it was just one century before, not even. Actually, the, the last Ottonians ruled, as you know, in the first half of the um, at the beginning of the uh, of the eleventh century. And in many ways, the Franconians had um, that were still part of the you know the, the, the Ottonians had ruled from a Saxon Franconian power. Right? So the, the Franconians were still connected to that grandeur, etc. Um, were of course, even just as emperors, German kings collecting that legacy universally. Uh, also, Benz of Alba, in spite of his scurrility, actually makes an interesting point, says, quote, Charles the Great, Charlemagne, and the three Ottos uh, were the greatest one, right? Uh, he made literally panegyrics about them, and um, he commended himself to Henry IV, the model of Emperor Otto III, who, quote, restored the monarchy of the whole empire thanks to the support of the bishops and because Otto III had been ruling from Rome, right? That was his home um, and uh, that was the eternal dream, of course, of the Germanic emperors, ruling from a centralized Italian peninsula all over Europe and the Mediterranean, in Rome, preferably and unavoidably as Roman emperors. Uh, but you know, Otto III's history is quite instructive because he also wrote a letter to the Romans by saying, why do you rebel all the time? And eventually they expelled him. So that, that was kind of the situation as always. And it wasn't at all a golden age as these uh, propagandists would like to make you believe. Um, so uh, the, the lifetime of such uh, pro-imperial bishops of the past, according to Benz of witness a golden age, right? Where the quote, there was no disturbance anywhere. Reason reigned everywhere. The earth enjoyed tranquility like the heavens. The clergy showed themselves as pious as the choirs of angels. Yes, you should have seen there where they, they kicked out of the third <laughs> out of Rome. In any case, um, it, it is true that the Ottonians had established that course of, of, of things, right? The Especially the the appointment of bishops that, that already ruled 
the cities in, in Italy. Comital authority, right? So even in there, it was always negotiating, essentially, a foreign government on those who already ruled the land and saying, do you accept us? You know, I will interfere in your affairs. I will, if you, you know, if you support me, I will confirm you as bishop. Yeah, because the, the, those factions in the cities already existed. And naturally, we're always connected with, say, I mean, it was not just the German uh, monarchs. It was a bit like everything, like the Byzantine Empire, other powers, right? So, and the firmness of reform were connected to that. The idea that the church uh, spiritual standard was to make the empire functionality was, was pretty pretty obvious. Those kind of moral standards were, were needed for making things work in, in a Christian society ruled by the emperor as well, no doubt. There's the other historian Lambert of Hersfeld locating the golden age of church and empire uh, in the reign of, of Charlemagne more specifically. Uh, he was a bit biased because Charlemagne had been protector and benefactor of the Hersfeld Abbey so it was just a, an important local tradition and perspective, but also Lambert fits this um, propaganda by saying that essentially the Carolingian age had been restored by Henry III, who was Belut Alter Carolus, that is to say, like another Charlemagne, uh, for virtues and achievements, so including the one of having properly defended the church, protected the church, and established also the same imperial uh, authority uh, in, in the West. Um, there is also um, an anonymous monk from the same Hersfeld, where Lambert wrote, that composed the most learned extant a defense of the same Vibert of Ravenna who was also celebrated in his achievements like Charlemagne as defender of the papacy um, and of his father Pippin III right, as well um, that had done basically the same had intervened in Italy against the Longbirds and so on whose purpose had been quote uh, reformare regnum francorum in pristine dignitatis, dignitatis statum right so to repristinate the Frankish kingdom to its former dignity, right? And so this idea of the of a of a golden age it also predated, right? In this sense, even the Saint Carolingian rule um, was, uh, and so also reflected what the empire had been in the West, in, in a way. And so the dignity, and so this superiority, and the fact that the imperium conferred that dignitas is crucial in understanding where did the Henricians drew the, the idea of moral superiority from. That is to say, the same one that had made these rulers attaining the imperium per se. Mm -hmm. But again, also this was a bit of a gray area because but still that's a temporal power. What does have the church to do with it and what did actually the Carolingians do? At least the, the first one. So Carolingian and Antonian ages were revived in the anti-Gregorian um, str uh, struggle as early as the in say in the earliest justifications also of the imperial right of investiture in this time, right, when the reform had just taken off. Uh, and naturally in those times they appeared closer, especially the Ottonian one, because it was just a few generations before. Um, and of course much of what had been established in Ottonian times still lived in the political and administrative practice of the, of the empire and of its church. And of the church, again, because they saw it as a church on their own, even though it was the universal church, but even there the problem was, yes, universal church, but are you the universal ruler? Mm -hmm. So these were all, of course, issues that within mostly an, an internal debate were not touched, and we can speculate on that, and probably they were aware of it.
right? So they were kind of, they were aware of the fact that we're, <laughs> you know, um, trying to round the, the square a little bit. But again, that's the point of propaganda. They had to convince someone. They had to convince also the, the people, especially in these southern areas where the people counted more, right? Um, and there is also, in fact, a c an important cultural divide, as we were saying before, between the what was happening in, in the Germanic emperor's milieu and in the Roman environments, in terms properly of divide between north and south of the Alps, and just two different areas of culture and, and civilization. Um, equally, uh, the um, fourth investiture privileges of Pope Adrian for Charlemagne and Pope Leo VIII for Otto I were to play an important role in the in the b debate um, of the imperial rights over the, the papacy. Uh, the defense of the claims of Henry IV and Henry V, you know that Henry IV was excommunicated, eventually he passed his uh, imperial crown to Henry V, uh, his son, was inspired by a vision of the early Middle Ages in which um, reges et imperatores succedentes exemplo caroli manni defensionem romane ecclesiae et aliarum ecclesiarum timore dei et caritate sancti petri devote prosecuti sunt investituras episcoporum facentes. Right? So, roughly, the, uh, the idea that uh, kings and emperors followed Charlemagne's example by devoutly striving to protect the Roman Church and the other churches in the fear of God and love of St. Peter and practiced, of course, the investiture of bishops, right, which was also in many ways the other the other way around um, given again they had to back each other support each other but there was always the reality of an autonomy that doesn't matter how extreme both these imperial and papal views were in, in, in a moment of the most intense ideological radicalization of political struggle in the middle ages that this literature well uh, beautifully, I would say, exemplifies, we're always uh, bringing to a, a negotiation and to an ambiguity at the end of the day. It was never fully solved um, in many ways, uh, especially in these moments where the empire could effectively achieve kind of an economic status by a certain degree in this world. And um, so it's really remarkable to to appreciate it because again they they fool you right you know if you if you believe them literally considering what we know today you would bring to this video making a consideration on what do they actually mean in a deeper sense but in in many ways they are the product of a, of a context that we must understand in the light of as we've seen most of these ideologues were perfectly fine with the idea of the reform uh, just it was about who had to invest whom, which entailed just de facto, even though same accuse of simony, because hell, these people controlled uh, enormous power, cathedral chapters in, in major cities, like they, you know, that, that were strategically located on the uh, on the imperial road to Rome. It, it was a, a massive. A massive interest, uh, a lot of money, a lot of power depended on that all the time. So it's obvious that they were struggling uh, for it with all these means. Uh, but this also reflects, in fact, the eventual development of the same institutions that, again, suffered important blows, especially the empire, in terms of properly what, you know, what pertain the um, the German national mark in the centralization of the German state but that also brought to 
to the better definition of certain areas of power within the same the same Europe that would not fundamentally be altered in a sense till till very recently and still being importantly based on the legacy left by the the emperor and, and the pope so we could digress extensively on this especially these uh, connections with the the older Carolingian and and uh, Ottonian empires are very really very fascinating right and very provocative in many ways but still it one should just appreciate also the the single event of, and the single um, let's say the single figures I think for example Vibert of Ravenna is a very fascinating one because he's you know, just think humanly speaking, a person that knew would basically become the target of of he he had an adventurous life, you know, this eventually he died of, of illness, but still within some this very intense war. So somebody would would believe after all in the imperial cause to the point of uh, you know to sacrificing his own life in the process and and still having deeply um, reforming concerns regarding the the church, right? And so these people were looking at the future uh, and um, essentially deciding what in, in in their mindset, in their worldview, the uh, the universal destiny should have been about, right? What then living accordingly, which even just by scale of, of thinking is, is pretty impressive, right, by the time being, and, and of course the, it tells you the stature of these individuals in, in many ways. Anyhow, for today we stop it here, just hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.